everybody lovely to see you all um i am going to be talking to um uh, dr claire feely and uh dr hazel keedle today about the birth trauma inquiry in the uk um i'm just going to wait for them to join um and then we'll be chatting today about what the inquiry is um what i can see uh And we'll just, just wait for Hazel to join as well. There we go. Accept. I did accept. Is it working? Hopefully. There we go. I've never done a three-way Instagram live before, so I don't know what it's going to look like on the screen. We'll see. Well, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh, and I can see Hazel. Hi. No, oh, can you not see me? No. I can see I, you. I can hear you though so that's good <laughs> strange can you see can you see yeah, me Hazel? i can see all i can see all three of us yes oh that's very weird i am here <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. good evening oh. good morning <laughs> claire's disappeared okay, no, well, it's, you're back again. Hey, sorry i was trying to fix that but i'm not going to play with that now just leave it as I it can, is i mean i I can, I can see you both so selfishly it's all good <laughs> <laughs> um i was so it's so nice to to, ch to chat to both of you today um it was actually it was hazel it was you that reached out yeah. wasn't it and wanted to do an instagram live um on the birth trauma inquiry and it's such a, a good idea because it's so important um and i don't feel like and you probably feel like this too both of you that it's not i don't think i haven't seen much about it on my Instagram feed. Now, considering my Instagram is just chocker full of birth workers, it's not getting the exposure that it needs in order to get the submissions and the feedback to change things. So I think this is a really good idea to be doing this today. Um, before we start, um, Hazel, do you want to talk a little bit about what prompted you to, to, to raise the profile of the, the birth trauma inquiry? Absolutely. So we have a birth trauma inquiry over here in Australia and it opened in June last year um, and then the hearing started from September and it's in New South Wales which is our most populated state in, in Australia and it was the first one that had been done over here and you know the the actual the the instagram reach from it was huge so we've got a lot of maternity consumer organizations over here um it was also prompted by some uh, a group uh, complaint that was happening in one of our regional hospitals and being supported by one of our consumer organizations some research that i'd put out on obstetric violence from the birth experience study and a few other little bits and pieces happening and a very progressive um member of parliament in the new south wales government so that all together created this birth trauma inquiry and then everyone went you know really quite active on social media and it ended up with over four thousand submissions and most of them being from women some being from healthcare providers and then organizations and even our group our research group put in um, a submission so it it did get a lot of um a lot of traction a lot of exposure and really that's what led to the large amount of um submissions and then because of that large amount of submissions people were listening um, and I, I would go to events and i went to one of it in the federal parliament in, in canberra and they were aware of it happening you know it was be it was getting exposure it was getting media in the U, in the uk but also in the us um, and getting a lot of exposure but that really was from the groundwork that was placed on social media by the consumer organizations and midwifery leaders um, and people in the birthing space, doulas and birth workers. So when I was actually meeting with Claire and Claire and I are working on the Birth Experience Study UK version now, and um, we were having a meeting and I was like, so where is all this stuff? Like, why is it not out there? So that's when I thought, well, um, you have a great reach. Um, and um, obviously I've worked with you before on a, on a podcast, so I thought I'd reach out to you. I was actually messaging you whilst I was on a Zoom meeting with Claire. So <laughs> it was all very spontaneous. <laughs> but it, I think you're right, it is, really, it is really important. And if you think about the UK statistics for birth trauma, 
we have around about 30,000 people experiencing birth trauma every year in the UK. That's potentially 30,000 stories of people who have experienced traumatic events in their birth that can potentially you know influence change and prevent that or minimize the chances of that happening to other people um and i suspect they haven't got anywhere near that many submissions yet so i think it's really important that we do expose um and promote the the inquiry um claire do you do you want to talk a little bit about what the what the inquiry is in the uk and what it what what is it aiming to do yeah yeah sure i mean i've not been involved with the working group i have um, it's because of the best study that I am so uh, familiar with what is happening um, with the uh, parliamentary inquiry. Um, but I do agree, I probably, probably some of it hasn't quite reached as far as one would hope. So when I went and did some digging um, to explore, and there's a great web page, it is a link in my bio, which um, gives the really clear instructions of what um, this um, multi, sorry, cross party party parliamentary inquiry is doing and looking for and they've even included some prompts um, across a whole spectrum of birth trauma because as we know it could span uh, psychological uh, trauma uh, emotional trauma uh, lead to PTSD it can also be physical trauma um, obstetric violence it is it encom that word that phrase encompasses such an enormous range of negative poor and quite frankly, really damaging experiences. But what is great when you go on to the web page is that there are some prompts on there. I know um, just off the top of my head, Make Birth Better and the Birth Trauma Association have been closely involved with um, the wording and the considerations of how to um, sensitively invite these submissions, because obviously, birth trauma has been a really is a really challenging experience so writing that out can be cathartic of course but it can obviously be triggering as well particularly if it's relatively recent and the other thing on that website like i said the link is in my bio and um, the submissions are open until the or the shuts on the 6th of february there's also a section for healthcare professionals and researchers to um you know to guide their submissions as well and like hazel said other they have that space as well in new south wales inquiry and that is really important as well when we think about the vicarious trauma that staff are experiences some of you would have watched the panorama program the other night that's just uh, you know one in many 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 hundreds and thousands of stories from staff obstetricians midwives alike um as well as those professionals working within the space i've now had amazing contact with those who are working in perinatal mental health services trauma services um across that whole spectrum as i said because trauma is obviously such a massive uh, topic and spans such a wide range of issues um so it's a great opportunity for them to feed into this inquiry about the work they're doing what are they seeing what are their women and birthing, birthing people talking about what's happened to them equally um, researchers we know that birth trauma has been researched for quite some time and you know the most uh, informative paper for me was cheryl becks from 2004 the most amazing piece of work which coined trauma is in the eye of the beholder so that's long time ago come on 20, 20 uh, sorry 2004 um but it has only seemed to really gain traction in the last i don't know five years ten years yeah maybe amongst really interested maternity birth workers and women and consumer groups but it does now seem to be making traction in those uh, spheres that we want like policy etc i don't know if that's enough but now Erin or keep going I've actually got the, one of the web pages up talking about the, the the inquiry and some of the objectives and I think you're right it, it spans like such a wide range of situations and experiences um, you know it talks about people's experiences of maternity care both antenatally during labour and birth and postnatally because it's not just during birth you know all the way through pregnancy and afterwards um it talks about um the impact of um 
looking about uh, birth trauma on on people's experiences, their d future decision making, whether they want to have another baby or not. I mean, that can really affect, you know, future family planning, for example. Um, looking at people's experiences of both physical and mental uh, health problems. Um, so looking at severe obstetric chair, uh, tears and whether they've been um, uh, diagnosed properly, mental health problems, um, perinatal mental health um, and access to, to, to support for that. Um, they want to look at um, policy as well, which I think is really, really important. And I would, uh, my, my, my um my positive side of my brain you know my my hopeful side really would like to see changes in policy because i personally feel and i can't speak for everybody but i think personally that a lot of the trauma that is caused um is caused by policies in 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 healthcare um so i think if we can have an honest you know, discussion around some of the policies and the impact those policies are having on people's birthing experiences um, and, and looking to change some of those policies, that would make my heart happy. My, my, my cynical side feels like, uh, is, it, is it actually going to change? Or, you know, are they gonna take what they want from this inquiry and, and you know, do the things that they think are right and maybe not do the things that actually are right to do? Um, but we won't get anywhere without trying, right? And, and gathering that information and analyzing it. Um, so like you said, the, the closing date is Tuesday, the, the 6th of February, which is not, is not very far away. I mean, it's February tomorrow. We've got, we've got a week left. Um, what would your advice be to somebody who's considering a sub writing a submission for this because I imagine it's it, it can, like you said it can be quite traumatic kind of reliving a traumatic experience and some people may not even realize that they've experienced birth trauma yeah. I can speak to that as we have gone through that process over here in Australia and you know we wanted to the way we were putting it across and certainly how the inquiry was being put across it was using a trauma-informed lens so we were very aware that it was it potentially could be traumatic to do and I think because of the um, exposure I was putting on Instagram as well, I was getting plenty of women contacting me who were unsure whether they should put their story in um, all the way through to the process of them actually putting it in. We also had consumer groups who sat with women, especially from diverse communities, in their kitchens to help them write their stories. And actually, I did get a lot of positive feedback. You know, women often felt that um, you know, the, the word, I love the word that, that Claire used, it was cathartic, you know, it was, it had a bit of healing. It felt like it, there, there was somewhere to put their um, trauma on paper, hoping that it's going to make change. We can't guarantee it's going to make change, but this is a very good opportunity to try and have a voice in that. And I would also come back to why women are doing it. And this, this blows my mind every time, because obviously, during, during and after, um, the, or during the inquiry time, people would say to me, Hazel, like, is this just gonna be bringing up lots of negative stuff and not actually changing policy or changing practice? And, I, and, and they would maybe be a little bit concerned about it. And I'd say, and I would just bring them back to the women who put in their stories. Why did they do it? And I, I get overwhelmed because what I think, what I really think at the core of sharing your story is that you actually want to make the maternity world a better place for the next generation of women coming through. It can't change what you did. It may change how you feel about it because of that process of writing it, submitting it, feeling like you have con contributed. But actually you're doing that to ensure and to try and help in some way to prevent preventable birth trauma into the future. And I think that is a very altruistic, beautiful process that people can do. So if you have gone through that experience, and yes, it, it, it's going to potentially be tricky for you to write that out. Just remember that you are actually having an input on other women who are gonna come through the maternity services in the UK in the future. And if we can tap into that in a large amount and go, actually, if I share what happened to me, or what I witness, or what I've researched, then I can make a difference for the future. So that's what I'm trying to tap in—that collective good, that collective ability—and um, to make change. And I think 
sharing stories, first-hand accounts of birth experience is really impactful. You know, one of the things that um, we're doing with my, my, my MVP that I chair um, is um, asking for service users to send in videos of them talking about their, their experiences, whether those were positive or, or not so positive, so that I can then ask to have those played at, you know, maternity board meetings and, you know, meetings with senior leadership or even team meetings with the midwives. Because I think reading a piece of paper and reading people's written experiences, you know, it is not as impactful as hearing somebody speak firsthand. But having 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 those experiences you know, explained and and um, p making them seem like the, the the individual, you know, a person, a real person, I think is really, really impactful. And I think when you've got that volume of stories as well, that's you can't ignore, you know, you can't ignore the impact that that's having. And they will see, and I already know what some of those themes are going to be. You already know what the themes are going to be that come through. Yeah. We, you know, they're, they're themes that we already know are there. You know, somebody, I think it was, uh, I can't who was it? One somebody commented earlier um, about the the fact that it's you know lack of communication. You know, it's not being listened to. It's not being uh, understanding your rights and you know how to advocate for yourself. Um, it's and it is policy and understanding that you can say no to policy just because there is a policy and guideline. You don't have to follow it. You know, I'm sure all of these things are going to come through um, in in the in the inquiry in the UK. Um, I'm just really yeah, absolutely and actually hearing New South Wales when you were saying about the audible stories like actually you have to listen to stories that did come alive in the hearings mm -hmm. because you know there were the submissions that came in and then women were invited as well as experts and researchers and and our um, New South Wales Health which is our health authority here in, in New South Wales they were invited to come along but those stories from women that that really cemented it and when I gave um I gave advice to our, our select committee over here and they asked me for like a final piece of advice after this big long session which was educating about birth trauma i said to them i really want you just to listen because the actual answers are in the women's stories yeah. especially from those that have had a traumatic experience and then gone on to have maybe a healing or redemptive birth looking yeah. at jill thompson's work there um that that actually they've got the answers like what went wrong first time, but then actually what went right the next time. So it's actually important to hear those positive stories as well, especially if it's following a traumatic experience, because the answers are there if we listen hard enough, if we actually read through those stories and look, um, I think really with that research lens as well, to look at what is it that's coming out from there. So, yeah, we need those stories. And I hope also that in the inquiry, in the hearings, that they do have women coming along to also then add add that add, add more depth to their story and um, because that's something that has been so powerful over here in new south wales i think i'll just add to that and a, a little bit answering uh what you asked earlier erin i understand and I, I saw a couple of comments flying through because it comes up so quick on here the politics in the uk has been so exhausting for such a long time and I don't know about you all, but it's very easy to descend into cynicism and what's the point and nothing's going to help, nothing's going to improve. And I, I honestly do understand that. I wax and wane personally all of the time. But this is an opportunity. This has never happened before. And chances are it, it may not happen again. Well, perhaps not in the, in the foreseeable future. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that I really understand we are so fatigued and worn down by what our political sphere has been like in every manner of our lives um, over the particular over the last five to seven years. And obviously we had the Panorama uh, documentary just a couple of nights ago. It's the same story, same story that is being coming up in every inquiry, every report about maternity services. And actually, I would say nationally, we've got excellent policy at the top. We've got some of the best policy in the entire world. Yet it doesn't seem the issue is, is the unintended consequences or some of that top policy not filtering down in, at that trust level. 
for example, personalised care has been top of the agenda since the 90s. And yet that's a big part of what these traumatic stories are, is not being listened to. Not ha and that means personalisation. You know, you can't, per you can't not personalise if you're not, you know, you can't personalise if you're not listening. Um, is just one small example. And then this context, and I've seen some comments coming through, this conflation, confusion, mixing up and muddling of the difference between policy and guidelines, which I think is what some people are getting at here, yeah. where guidelines are being used in a coercive um, way. And that is something, as many of you who are listening here know is a topic de dear to my heart, that is that trust level thing that we've all and i know you're doing amazing work with the mvp to shift the dial on that and to and with this work uh the inquiry as well again lifting centering women and birthing people's voices hopefully will also help shift that dial and start to shake off the shackles of fear around the majority of maternity professionals who are wanting to do a good job which is person-centered woman-centered but feel very restricted in order to do that. And some of that is, is, isn't is entirely based on fact. It's become a cultural fear you know, that someone stepping outside of guidelines means my pin's on the line. Some of that, it can feel very real and true, but very often that fear is, is taking over, which is what's really negatively influencing um, women's outcomes and experiences from both sides of the spectrum of decision making and choices. We know women are, aren't being listened to when they feel like there's a problem with their baby in the antenatal period. We know from the statistics back in Asian women are much, much less likely to report being listened to. And it's a big contributing factor to the poorer outcomes. And then we've got the other side where there is too much, as we, you've all heard me say, too much medicine going on, too much intervention, and, and too much coercion around what is seen as the norm. So whether that's your routine induction um, and our rates are obviously very, very, very high. So I just wanted to touch on, I understand the apathy and exhaustion. I'm fed up with the system as it is, but I do want to echo Hazel's point here that this is, this is um, a very rare opportunity at that level, that parliamentary level. Actually, you know, I just want to jump on that too, because also we had a lot of that over here too, saying what is the point? We've had inquiries on different things, nothing ever changes. And my response to that is, well, well what's the alternative? Mm. If we do nothing, if we say nothing, if we don't put these, these um, stories in, nothing will change. Yeah. You know, we, we, we can't, can't hope that somehow it will magically change overnight. It won't unless we have the people power behind it. And we are in a democracy. We have the opportunity to make a difference. And it might not change as much as we want, but it will be another voice in there, another opportunity. And this time we've got the ear of government actually going, oh, there is such an issue of birth trauma. We've got the opportunity to actually expand that definition and understanding of what birth trauma is, because really it's, it is that perinatal trauma. We're actually having the opportunity to educate so many women. And after the, after the um, submissions and the hearings that we've had over here, so many more women have then reached out and said, I didn't realize that's what I had experienced. And some women who had decades ago experienced birth trauma saw it then as an opportunity to validate what happened to them and actually get support and therapy to then help with what happened to them. But if we do nothing, if we have that apathy, if we have the, well, what's the point? Then nothing will change. Yeah. And I, I just want to touch on, you know, the something Claire said about, you know, hearing different voices and hearing, you know, diverse, uh, embracing diversity in those, in those stories. Because I think it's really important that we do encourage you know minority groups to to feed into this as well because they probably have a higher percentage of birth trauma i suspect um and uh, and they really do need to be represented in the inquiry so i would i would definitely hope that other birth workers who maybe are watching this or anybody who works in the birth sphere 
um, or has, you know, connections with different communities to encourage those communities to, su to submit their feedback as well, because they, uh, if their voices aren't heard, then they won't be represented. Um, and it's not a true reflection. Um, I find it slightly overwhelming, to be honest, um, like the, because this is, when we talk about birth trauma, it's such a small little phrase and it's so multifaceted. You know, there is so many different things that could be causing or impacting or, you know, you know having influencing birth trauma. I mean, we've talked about a, a small, you know, a small handful of, of things, but, you know, the, the, you know, the staffing in the NHS and, uh, you know, and, and the issue with our, 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 um, our lack of midwives, you know, um, lack of training on um, all sorts of different areas that midwives don't get time to, you know, to, to be trained on, you know, compassion fatigue and midwifery, you know, lack of understanding on, on, you know, what legally, what a midwife is allowed to kind of, you know, advise or you know support and having and giving midwives you know the, the confidence and ability to support an out of guidelines birth if that's what somebody wants you know understanding you know consent you know and then also all of the actual obstetric things that can happen during a birth um and the lack of antenatal education you know it's like i could go on and on and on about this huge long list of things that are potentially impacting and causing birth trauma and it blows my mind a little bit how they're going to condense that <laughs> into you know a list of things that need to be addressed um but you've got to but i guess start somewhere yeah. right? and you've got to you don't know how big it is until you start listening and yeah. when we look at the numbers over here from the birth experience study uh, which was Australia's largest national um, maternity survey with over with nearly 9,000 women completing it. Um, you know, the numbers are real. You know, one in three women experiencing birth trauma, one in, more than one in 10 women experiencing obstetric violence. Um, that's, that is there and we then need to hear that and then go, what can we do to prevent that? Mm -hmm. Also, your point about, um, you know, having, having stories from, um, more diverse communities and more vulnerable communities is vital. And you said, you know, you, they've probably got higher rates. They have. I can tell you that from our birth experience study. Um, and we put that in our submission to um, the New South Wales Inquiry. There were the, the highest rates of birth trauma and obstetric violence were actually in our young mums. So young mums under the age of 24 having babies, they had the highest rates. And then it was with our First Nations women. So here in Australia, our First Nations women, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, um, and they again had higher rates of birth trauma and obstetric violence. And then it was with our migrant women, so women who have come to Australia, and we have a very multicultural and high um, amount of migrant, nearly 30% of women who've birthed in Australia are, have been born overseas. And so is that also had higher rates um, of birth trauma and obstetric violence. So it's vital to hear their stories we had a whole day of hearings here in New South Wales, which was really dedicated to listening to the experiences of women and um, professionals who, um, who are from First Nations communities and from migrant communities. And that was such an important day. But there are other communities too that we haven't really explored and best and we will, and I know Claire will in her survey, and that's people from the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah. And that's also people with disabilities who are then going through um, maternity care. We need to hear their voices. Some research that's come out from over here shows that they do have you know, very difficult experiences in maternity care. So that's also women that we need to hear from. So if you do fit any of those <laughs> groups, we need to hear from you, but also people who are, like you said, working in those communities, working al alongside women from those communities also need to put that across. And if you're a consumer group or a charity that works with women in those, in those groups, they also need to um, to put a submission in too. Yeah, there's, yeah. There, I guess there's so many different avenues, so many different routes to to gain to gain gather up that feedback. And charities actually isn't something that I would have thought of, but they, you know, mental health charities, um, you know, will be uh, particularly if they focus on uh, on birth, you know, birth trauma would definitely, you know, should have a voice and a seat at the table. When when with with the New South Wales um, inquiry, who was who was involved with, you know, analysing all of that feedback? And because, again, it's so complex. And, 
you know, I think whoever we need people like midwives and doulas and other a range of different birth workers, as well as politicians and everybody else who's going to be involved, because there's so much nuance involved with birth, isn't there? And, you know, without the right context, things can be very easily misinterpreted. So how 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 did that work in terms of like analysing the research and the, 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 the feedback and making sure that things were not kind of skewed or misinterpreted? Well, that was the job of the hearings. So, you know, there'd be the stories that came in and I must say they were managed so well by the team behind um, the birth trauma uh, inquiry over here in New South Wales, an all-female team who uh, followed up women. And, and that's amazing to think there were, you know, there were so many that came in, but if they, when they saw one that came in, they would then contact that woman and see if she was okay. Like, you just put that submission in, are you actually okay? And then the, the job of the select committee, which is um, cross-party as well over here in, in New South Wales, is to question that. So people who had put in submissions, they'd work with the submissions team and look at who, who do they then ask to come along to find out more. Um, and if actually, because it's been spread out and there's still they're still going to do some more this year, actually, which is quite interesting, um, they would look at they would look at who can come along to give them more information. So myself and Professor Hannah Darling from the birth experience team, we were there uh, and, and Hannah had the, you know, coined the, you know, this is the me too of, um, of maternity or, or, or birthing women. And that's really important. Um, and they then had that opportunity to ask questions. So you're, you're then that expert witness or for, or women are coming and share the stories and then you're asked questions. But really importantly, what I'm very, um, I'm very pleased that they did this is from the very beginning, they would engage with experts like myself and others to find out how could they do that in a trauma informed way. So even how to do the hearings mm -hmm. and they took on our feedback. You know, they, we would, they would, we'd ask them, well, what does it look like when you do a hearing? Cause I'd never done one. And one of the things they said was this bright light on you because they're filming it. And the psychologist that I was working with is also a midwife. She's like, well, can you imagine if you're sharing a story of trauma and that's at you? So they changed that and got rid of it. And even just the language, we're lucky actually that the chair, Emma Hurst, is a psychologist as well. So she was very good at using signposting. Um, so letting someone know what's coming next when they're giving evidence. But that was the job of the hearings. The hearings is to really explore those submissions and then have the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. Certainly those questions are much, much tougher on people like myself um, and they're very different to women that, um, and people that were sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. I just, can I just jump in there just to clarify that there is a difference between an inquiry gathering evidence like this and what we say about what's research evidence. Um, and it might sound like semantics, but the processes are somewhat different. There'll be some similarities as well. And I certainly wouldn't be able to tell you what our inquiry is doing with that. But that's something that we would hope would be quite uh, transparent as the process goes on. Obviously, they're still open uh, for submissions at the moment. And I've just seen a comment asking when the deadline is, is, which is the 6th of February for submissions. It isn't a survey. So what Hazel's been talking about uh, when, she, when she said survey and what's coming over to the UK, which I'll be leading as part of Hazel's team now, is the birth experience studies um, survey, which is a piece of research that, well, the Hazel, gosh, that's what's um, raised the awareness and got you all the way to the parliamentary inquiry, which has influenced and impacted over here. Um, but it hasn't been done in the UK yet. And that's what I'm working with my research team and consumer groups in the process. So on one hand, it might feel a bit duplicate and that's fair enough if that's what it feels like but because research does take a little bit of time to to get off the ground which is the blessing and curse i would say um there will i think what is quite good um the best study will hopefully keep that momentum so if there is any flagging and obviously guys we know we're in election year so there might be some things that drop off the radar the best study hopefully with everyone's support those on this call now and across social media then we'll push it back up the top of the agenda with the findings from the research study whereas in Australia it was the other way around we can do it this way around which is totally fine but we'll just keep the conversation and keep it at the top of the agenda whoever is in charge yeah 
Absolutely. And Erin, I hope that, you know, once the Birth Experience Study UK goes live, you get Claire back on to talk about, you know, what the survey Definitely. is, because it does cover everything from antenatal down to all the way through to breastfeeding. It's not only about birth trauma and such violence, but it's obviously a very important um, part of it, because that's really what's come out on ours. And um, yeah, started over here, but we actually have 13 countries now on board um and uh, the uk is is one thing that i'm very excited about we've got brazil literally about to start theirs um so we've got uh, you know we've got these research groups across the world who are working on the survey as well because really we we need to listen to voices and that's what this inquiry all comes down to if we don't listen to those voices if we don't elevate women's voices then you know who are we designing those maternity services for we'll just keep designing them because they're good for the system or they're good for the professionals which obviously has importance but at the end of the day they've got to be good and not harmful to women and birthing people yeah someone's meant are uh, asked um who can submit um uh who can send a submission and is it only for england no i think it's you it's uk so anyone in the uk and anyone that's experienced birth trauma um i'm just i'm just having a quick look at oh, the, yeah. the website and partners and dads as well yeah. from what i've seen um, are welcome to submit because obviously we do know and um, that's been shining a light some fabulous um, voices here which are really um amplifying the issues that uh, birth partners and particularly um the research is centered on on fathers mm -hmm. and the trauma that they experience and postnatal depression and the impact of some of those um those peri Natal trauma. I'm going to remember that, Hazel. Perinatal. Um, I just want to just finish up today with just signposting people to where they can get support because obviously it can, it can it, you know, the whole discussion can be quite triggering for somebody who's experienced birth trauma. Um, so um, there's the Birth Trauma Association peer support um which and I'll, I'll i'll make sure i put all of these in in the um the caption when i when i save this to my grid so that people can access it um make birth better which um you've already mentioned um bliss um which is another um uh organization for families of premature and sick babies um masic m-a-s-i-c um for anybody that support has um experienced uh injuries as a result of birth um and then we have sands which is a charity uh which i've raised money for last year um for anybody who has um experienced the loss of a baby um i will also make sure that i put the um the link to this website that i've been reading off of because it's got all the information on how someone can can submit um their their experience um is there anything else that you wanted to to, to raise today or cover uh with regards to the to the inquiry i, I just don't want to say look i really honor the fact that this can be a difficult thing to do for women and, and birth people we're asking you to rip open that wound that you'd packed up you know you'd already healed it in some way or dealt with it in some way and moved on with your life but we're actually asking you to unpack that to rip off that band-aid and actually then share that trauma with the inquiry and that's a very hard thing to do and i give a lot of honor to the fact that you're going to do that for us but it can be very difficult to patch that back up and continue with your life which is also what we're asking you to do mm -hmm. so please well if you've done that and you're then having to live in that trauma again for a little while, then please do reach out to those helplines because that's what they're for. Have someone who can then listen to you because when you're writing it, you, know, you don't have that therapeutic <laughs> relationship happening. You're just writing it and then putting it in. And if that then leaves you in, the, in a place that is difficult to be in, then please do reach out and get help because we then know you're going to get on with your life. You know, you're going to then look after your children that day or go to work. And that's not easy. And I am someone who has experienced birth trauma and obstetric violence and previous trauma. And I know how difficult that is when you have to reshare or go there, even after many, many years. So please do reach out for support or if you've got your own psychological support that you prefer to go to, reach out to them and just say, you know what, I've just done this really big thing. I just want to talk about it. So don't just leave it and go off on your life and then have to you know, be 
thinking about and living in that trauma space, go and get support. And that's why those helplines are there. Thank you. Claire, did you have any closing thoughts or comments for today? I think Hazel sums that up beautifully and there's nothing to add beyond that. But thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much for your time today, guys. And um, I will make sure that I share all of the links um, and I'm going to tag a billion different birth <laughs> workers in my post. So hopefully they can share it. Um, and yeah. other organisations like LGBT Mummies and uh, Queer Birth Club and, you know, Five Times More and other organisations that also represent minority groups so that hopefully they can reshare and encourage people to feedback their their experiences too um but thank you hazel for suggesting the live um and i hope that it's yes. i hope that it's given given the inquiry the exposure that it needs and deserves and i really do hope that something good comes from it um and we'll keep we'll keep in touch and um i'm looking forward to hearing all about the uh the, the study um and the survey and i'll definitely be sharing that as well when when it's when it's ready thank uh, well, you for hosting erin as always you. you're fabulous yeah but thank you so much for responding and, and getting us on so quickly it, it's really um you know it, it's so important that we use our voice at this time and so thank you erin for, for doing no that worries. all right enjoy your evenings thank you <laughs> thank bye. you bye bye